On the, 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 the presenters today, uh, we have um, Alessandro uh, Crimi. Alessandro, there you are. Uh, we have, uh, who's from the uh, ETH in Zurich and uh, Ames in Ghana, uh, Rebecca Bailey. And Rebecca, hi. Uh, Anne Marie uh, Saarinen. Is that correct? Forgive my pronunciation. Saarinen? Very good. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, in, uh, unfortunately, Dr. Mohamed uh, Sangare uh, can't make it uh, today, uh, but he's been represented by uh, Francois Loris uh, from the International Institute uh, of uh, Communications and Development. Uh, Francois, welcome. And, uh, and then finally, we have uh, Anne uh, Genitz. Excellent. There you go. And, uh, and I, I'll, I'll introduce each uh, a speaker now at the moment. So uh, we'll, we'll get on with the, the time. Um, your orders, okay? You've got to be careful. Now, this is like Mission Impossible. You have eight minutes to give your presentation. Uh, you, there will be about three minutes for Q&A. Uh, I'll probably just knock on the table when you're about a minute from your eight minutes. We've got to try and keep it on time. We're already a few minutes behind, uh, and we'll try and keep it on time if possible. So do you accept your mission, folks? Excellent. Right. So first up is Alessandro Crimi, and Alessandro is going to talk to you about prenatal care uh, uh, on SMS base for communities and remote ultrasound imaging. Uh, so Alessandro, would you uh, give us your eight minutes? So good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the possibility to present our project. I am a researcher of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich and a lecturer at the African Institute of Mathematical Science in Ghana. And the project, this is not my day-by-day -day work, but it's a project we have uh, been carrying out in cooperation with these two institutions. And uh, it's about uh, prenatal care using a community health worker and uh, a new way we are trying to do with the uh, remote ultrasound. So first I will give you a brief uh, uh, background about uh, Ghana and what we are doing and then briefly again to our uh, health workers and then our system uh, with the remote ultrasound and uh, the results we have obtained so far. So as uh, you probably know there is in low-income countries there is a shortage of uh, medical personnel uh, especially in the rural areas and Ghana it's a uh, Beautiful country, beautiful weather, and nice food, but they also have a problem related to the shortage of uh, medical staff. In uh, our case, we are interested in uh, prenatal care, and of course, there is uh, there are some issues related to prenatal care. For example, there is a relatively high uh, infant mortality, far from the what we have in the high-income country, and. The majority of the issues related to infant, infant mortality are uh, avoidable. And of course, the, the element we want to attack is the fact that some of these issues are avoidable, but they're related to the fact that there are uh, transportation issues for these women. So they have to travel a lot, they have to lay uh, they, uh, their job that day to uh, attend the prenatal care or even the delivery date. And trying to uh, quantify a bit better, we know, uh, there's been a survey conducted some, a couple, some years ago in uh, 2009 where it uh, has was, was been even identified that uh, only the 50% of the women they were attending for uh, prenatal care. Uh, we, we selected some communities between uh, uh, Ghana, uh, in, in Ghana, between uh, Accra and Cape Coast, and we repeated this kind of investigation uh, for the previous year, five years, and we noticed that this, this pattern is still, uh, is still there. So actually, we even noticed a higher percentage of people, uh, of women, they were completely not uh, having delivery at the hospital, uh, not completely not uh, uh, attending the, prenatal, the four prenatal cares. So how we thought about uh, to tackle this, uh, this issue is, uh, the arguments of this summit using uh, community health workers and new technologies. And our innovation is actually in the, in the last part, as I will tell you later. Uh, okay, this was in case just to, there's been several uh, st uh, studies about community health workers as probably most of the people in this room knows. And for us, when we, we were involving community health workers, we, we, I'd like to stress that we, are not, we were not selecting uh, midwives or nurses 
we, were, we have been selecting people with just, uh, uh, with just the secondary high school to see if they were able and also if, if it can be, this approach can be scalable in areas where literally there is no nurse and no doctor. So this is um, more or less the summary of uh, uh, our approach. So we have a, a community uh, with a community uh, where we selected some com several communities. Uh, we did only with 10 because uh, we, were, we didn't have any uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation we were running on low budget, but we selected 10 uh, communities. From each community, we, uh, we selected one health worker that is, was equipped with a mobile phone, with an app that they can relate to, uh, uh, to an online platform to report uh, information about pregnant women and to receive information in case, uh, in case there is some alarm signs. But the new things we tried to do was to in include in the community uh, initiative some uh, sonographers that they were acquiring uh, uh, ultrasound scans and they were sending uh, these scans through the online platform to a doctor in, in uh, big cities, in, uh, in the hospital in Accra. So the, the selection, the, the training of the health workers was quite uh, straightforward. So we just had some meetings with the chiefs in the village. So we selected a, a woman uh, through a, uh, a, a public assembly. And then after the training, it was uh, just two weeks, just to give them just the basics of uh, uh, the prenatal care and to be, they were uh, continue to have some kind of uh, training afterwards. And we noticed that, uh, as I say, they were just people with, uh, women with the uh, secondary high school. Uh, we noticed that even if there was the same level of uh, education, the youngest one, they were more prone to catch up with the uh, uh, training and also to use the app. So the old one, they were kind of a bit lost. They were not used to uh, learn a new mob mobile phone technologies. And we gave them, of course, a T-shirt, a mobile phone, some pregnancy tests, some uh, uh, measuring tape just to assess in case some of malnutrition and some simple uh, supplements like folic acids. Uh, okay. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this is a uh, gift. Yeah, I'm, I'm. She's usually she's supposed to to register. So the main the main task are to register pregnant women, uh, pregnant women in their community, and to report dangerous signs like uh, he con continuous headache, uh, continuous vomiting, malaria, or preeclampsia, or anything else. But they were also uh, giving some kind of advice in terms of uh, nutrition and family planning. As I told you, even with the support of the uh, health workers, the issue of transportation uh, or going to uh, attend prenatal care in a big hospital in a, in a clinic was not so feasible for some of them still so what we what we conclude what we, what we try to do is to take another person who was of course uh, again not a nurse not a physician but just a bit more high educated uh, health worker was uh, was sim simply uh, just graduated students, not from medical school, actually, from computer science. And we tried to give them some uh, training from the, with the, as a sonographers, like they attended five, uh, five intensive lectures with a sonographer, and according to the gynecologist, they were ready to uh, acquire some images. We tried, and apparently the gynecologist uh, was satisfied with the uh, uh, images acquired remotely. So what they were doing was that every month they were going to each of these community with their own uh, transportation means and this remote ultrasound that was uh, just a portable ultrasound that we hacked uh, with the uh, GSM. So substantially it was like a laptop uh, with a GSM connection. It was like a, let's say, a bit more complicated mobile phone. So it, it could send almost immediately to the information system the acquired scans. Okay, so, so what we noticed was that uh, 
despite the low, low budget of the project, uh, we have been successful. We have been managing to uh, collect, uh, enroll uh, 200 women that we are, we are sure, at least for the one we are following, that the 70% of them had uh, the, delivered in an hospital or in clinics. And also we noticed that we were able to detect some uh, critical cases like ectopic and uh, breech pregnancies and actually even some hepatite cases of hepatitis B. Uh, at the moment, the challenge is to make this project a bit more bigger, scalable, and also consistent on time, but we are looking at some kind of, uh, kind of financing within the community. Okay. Yep. You're done? Uh, give me one minute. <laughs> Great, great. That well, well done. <laughs> so mission accomplished uh, for, uh, for, for Alessandro. Um, are there any questions for Alessandro at this point? Could I actually ask a question then? Um, the, the, the big issue seemed to be the, the distance that people had to travel was a big barrier to actually accessing their doctor. Uh, but the, the other issue probably would be there's an availability of uh, healthcare workers Anyway, did, did you do a survey as regards the, the gaps of the amount of health workers that might be needed uh, to first to try and see how many people you might need to train? And you mean for how for each community or in general in Ghana? In, well, well, whichever way you did you do did you do it by community or did you do it by Ghana? I, I don't know. But generally, we we thought that for a community of yeah. few thousand people or each community, one person would have been enough. Okay. So of course, the, it's a bigger, the, there should be more, but around 10,000, 20,000, it's one should be enough. Okay. As long as it's, it's known, uh, okay. it's active, she's active, she's known, uh, she's yeah. going around. So one per 40,000. But there's been actually an estimate by the one million, uh, I think they estimate for Ghana overall, there should be at least 10,000. 10,000, okay. It's a, quite a target, obviously, and... Uh, uh, so congratulations on, uh, on, on the achievements to date. Um, well done. Now the problem yeah. is yeah. expansion. 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 Any question down the back? Have we microphones? Um, I just great presentation. Thank you. I'm Jane from Johns Hopkins. Um, I just had a quick question: Is to once you discover that potentially there is a hazard or you know, a problem, a potential ectopic or breech pregnancy, mm. do you have the mechanisms to then get these women to care, given the, the constraints of the budget and the providers that are potentially may not be in the area? This is still a problem. It's the same problem also even if they have to deliver. So what we try to do is that uh, they, they, the community health, uh, health worker <laughs> should think about this kind of scenario and should think who can eventually uh, help the, this woman with the transportation. Yes, but it's still uh, a problem. In these cases, we have, ex ex we have been experiencing the, the issue was solved. But I, it's, uh, it, again, it's not uh, uh, stable. It's not guaranteed for everybody that uh, we could, we, with this system we can uh, sustain this. We're going to have to leave it there. Um, Alessandro, thank you very much for a great presentation. Thank you. So uh, next uh, on, on, on the list to present to you now is uh, Rebecca Bailey. And Rebecca is from the Intra Health International Organization. And uh, the title of uh, Rebecca's uh, talk to you is the Interactive Voice Response and Basic Mobile Phones, uh, a low cost approach to deliver refresher training to health workers. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues in Senegal who unfortunately couldn't be with us today on our experience with a health worker training approach that uses interactive voice response on basic mobile phones. InterHealth has been working with the government of Senegal for more than a decade to train healthcare providers and improve health outcomes. And we're well aware that traditional training approaches are often expensive and require health workers to leave their posts for training. And we see that mobile technologies offer an opportunity to provide training at lower cost and with fewer disruptions in service delivery. But to date, most M-Learning initiatives have relied on SMS text on mobile phones, which deliver only small amounts of information 
or on smartphones or tablets, which are relatively expensive and require access to the internet. So our goal was to create an effective learning system and approach that could be used on standard mobile phones, but able to deliver more information than an SMS text. We chose interactive voice response, or IVR, as the delivery method. And IVR technology delivers recorded message, messages to any type of phone and allows users to provide feedback by pressing a number key. Um, you've probably experienced IVR when you call your bank or other customer service system that responds with a voice recording and then asks you to press or say a number to get more information. So for the educational approach, we chose spaced education, and it's a distance learning approach that asks questions and then provides detailed responses repeatedly over time. And a number of studies have shown that the testing and spacing effects of spaced education lead to sustained improvements in clinical knowledge and also changes in behavior. So our pilot or phase one project had three main aims to develop and deploy an M-learning system using IVR and SMS technologies, to assess the feasibility and acceptability of the system for providing a family planning refresher training, and to measure changes in knowledge and perceived abilities in relation to course content. The course focused on family planning side effects, rumors, and misconceptions which was a refresher or follow-up to a training that IntraHealth conducted in 2009. And the content was developed with the Senegal Ministry of Health and directly aligned with national practice guidelines and training curricula. It involved 20 questions asked and answered repeatedly over an eight-week period and was complete when a trainee responded correctly to all questions twice. 20 health workers in the Thais region of Senegal who had completed initial training and had their own standard mobile phone were selected to participate. This slide shows the hardware and software structure of the system. The hardware is listed at the top in the black bars. The blue bars show the open source software we used. So it was GAMU for, sorry, yeah, GAMU for the text messages to schedule the IVR calls, free switch to deliver the calls, and Moodle to manage the learning contact, content. Uh, the red bar dep depicts the custom scripts or middleware that we had to develop to manage interactions between the software. And the dashed red and blue lines show the communications by SMS and IVR between the learners with their mobile phones and the system to schedule and then deliver the training content. For some of the findings, all 20 participants completed the course within nine weeks. Uh, the chart on the right shows that most le learners actually finished in five weeks, but one person took nine weeks because they didn't realize they'd completed, they had not completed the course and needed to be reminded. Uh, 620 texts were sent out to schedule the calls. Uh, the system initiated 619 calls and 496 of those were successfully delivered. About 20% of the calls dropped due to poor network uh, reception. Um, in addition, during the first week of the course, uh, there were some delays due to not having enough airtime credits, um, et cetera, but we were able to resolve those uh, problems fairly quickly. Uh, the majority of calls were delivered outside of normal working hours with the medium time of the day at 5.16 p.m. and the average call being about 13 minutes. Uh, participants could choose to answer between one and four questions at a time. Uh, most of the participants chose to answer three to four questions at a time. Uh, this supported our assumption that M-learning can be less, disrupti less disruptive to service delivery than other forms of training. At the beginning of the course, sorry. At the beginning of the course, learners specified that they would actually like to receive the text um, during the times noted here in, by the red stars. But once the course started, they actually um, ended up doing the, the calls either early in the morning or, or late in the day. 
Feedback from participants showed the system was both feasible and acceptable. The overall experience of training by mobile phone was rated either good or very good by all participants. And 90% reported that the instructions were easy or very easy to follow. The largest criticism, which was mentioned by 35% of trainees, was the poor network reception that was reflected in the number of calls that were dropped um, during the training. A written test taken before the course showed that knowledge was relatively high at baseline, which is to be expected because it was a refresher trainer, re refresher training. But even so, the post-test results showed significant gains in knowledge, which were sustained after 10 months when measured again during a supervisory visit. So in summary, we demonstrated that both the IVR technology and spaced education as a learning approach were feasible to implement in a low resource setting. The course was appreciated and accepted by learners. In fact, more than 50% of trainees spontaneously recommended using the approach for other training topics and expanding it to other districts. In addition, the course was associated with gains in knowledge and created little disruption to health service delivery because workers remained at their facilities and most of the training was done outside working hours. For future applications, we recommend including a trial or test period before launching the course to test the, the system, exploring lower cost options for making the IVR calls, such as an inter internet based uh, Skype system, and adding an automated tracking mechanism to alert learners to when they've achieved important milestones in the course. We believe that the system can be scaled up and expanded to deliver the same course to more learners and also courses on other topics, but this should be done only if it contributes to the training needs of Senegal. And if the approach is applied on a larger scale, we also recommend close monitoring and evaluation to generate evidence of its effectiveness and its cost effectiveness. And finally, we suggest considering the use of IVR technology more broadly in future M-Learning initiatives in order to meet training needs. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic, and thank you very much for that, uh, Rebecca. Uh, are there any questions from the floor um, for Rebecca on the use of the mobile technology? Oh, yeah. So down the back. Uh, yeah. Hi, Larry King from Johns Hopkins. Great talk and great example of how to do an evaluation of a pilot program. I was wondering though, moving forward, if you had considered or uh, are able to compare this method of training to conventional training techniques and see if it may be equivalent or even superior and more cost effective potentially. Uh, at the moment, um, well, this particular training approach, um, at the moment, we, the, in, in Senegal, the government is looking at the various uh, training approaches that are being piloted and making some decisions about whether or not to scale up. Um, in general, I think it, it was suggested yesterday that um, what we would be interested in doing is looking at whether or not this particular approach is effective in achieving its objectives, and perhaps we could compare it with other similar courses, but I, I, I've been involved in evaluations that try to compare um, different approaches to delivering content, and it's very, very difficult to, to make those comparisons. So I think the best you can do is measure whether you've achieved your learning objective and track the cost of that and look at the cost per trainee and perhaps you could compare that with similar courses um, which are trying to develop similar um, competencies. Okay, we have time for one more question. You, you, yeah. Hi. And just to follow up on that point, um, I was wondering from a learning point of view, what, does robust, what are robust measures of effectiveness? The measures were gains in knowledge. Can you expand a little bit more on what that might be? Uh, with, we had learning objectives in terms, yeah, the questions themselves were related to, for example, uh, 
IUD insertion, what might be some of the, the complications that uh, a patient might, um, might experience? How would you explain that to the patient? What uh, treatment would you recommend? So it was quite clinical, but also um, behavioral as well. As chairman's uh, privilege here, I might just uh, like on that point, uh, uh, I think we, we always look for the holy grail of change in behaviour, and that change in behaviour should uh, uh, trans translate into uh, improved patient outcome. Right. Uh, and that's, it's sometimes it's easy uh, with certain types of education, you give them training, they do it, and all of a sudden there's an outcome. Sometimes it isn't so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that's something that we probably, through maybe clinical audit, uh, and linking that to the learning objective is probably some of the, the, the ways we could go there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, okay, um, I'll have to call it at that and move on to the next one. So thanks very much, Rebecca. Well done. Thank you. Right, and uh, our, our third speaker in this session then is uh, Anna Marie uh, Saarinen, and Anna Marie is also uh, going to speak on behalf of her colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Caroline. Uh, no, no, Caroline is presenting with you. Yep. Car where's Car there you are, Carolyn. Great. <laughs> so we have a double act. And uh, so Carolyn McGregor from the um, uh, University of Ontario is, is, is there. And Anna, Anna Maria is uh, in the Newborn Foundation. And the title of your talk is Can a Little Red Beam of Light Save Newborn Lives? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And congratulations to all the um, conveners of this meeting. It's my first year. So um, as a health economist and public policy person, this has been a great experience to learn from um, all the different perspectives here. So thanks for allowing us. Um, so uh, I want to share a little bit about the history of our project real quickly um, to give it just a little bit of context. It started about five years ago when my own daughter was diagnosed at 48 hours old with critical congenital heart disease. We were on our way out the nursery door with an asymptomatic baby. And she um, had one last uh, stethoscope check before we left had a mild murmur that was going to be checked at her well baby visit. That led to um, an echocardiogram because the echo tech happened to be at the hospital evaluating another baby. Had that not happened, we would have gone home. And she was in profound heart failure and ended up surviving two heart surgeries in very short order after that. So um, what, what that brought us to was a pilot project, the first ever conducted from a multi-center standpoint in the United States, done in a collaboration with the State Department of Health to look at how pulse oximetry could help earlier detection of critical heart lesions and also look at secondary and non-target conditions. Um, so uh, from a policy perspective, while we were doing that pilot, um, I was able to go to Washington, D.C., uh, present uh, the data, get it co-presented with one of the members of the federal committee that advises on newborn screening. Um, and the condition critical congenital heart disease was then nominated, went through evidence review, within nine months was recommended to the Secretary of Health and Human Services that all four million newborns in the United States be screened for heart defects before they leave the hospital. That happened within 18 months of starting point and um, we were at uh, less than 0.011% of newborns being screened um, in the new well baby nursery in the United States in 2000. 10, and today we're at 90%. That's what that map reflects, and there's just a few states left to still implement in the US. So from there, um, that brought a bit of notoriety to the United States. We were the first place to really do a large population health initiative to add something to the routine uniform screening panel that was a point of care screening. And the government of China reached out to us to help look at their newborn screening infrastructure, but also to specifically to look at this particular screening. There's um, a about similar, slightly higher occurrence rate of congenital heart disease in China, and many babies were leaving the nursery undetected and coming back either in shock or dying at home, so having much poorer outcomes or either mortality. And um, they are also number four uh, internationally on um, the list of uh, highest rates of newborn mortality as a percentage under five mortality. And a lot of that is due to sepsis and pneumonia, particularly the further west you go in the lower resource settings. So our objective in trying to implement this screening was to reduce newborn deaths by uh, a third and advance this as a, a public health initiative for screening all 18 million annual births in China. Um, to do so, we had to work with one of the manufacturers of a pulse oximetry technology that is specifically geared for newborns, meaning it measures through perfusion and, and uh, or measures a perfusion index and measures 
through motion, two of the conditions in which all neonates are <laughs> particularly susceptible to. Um, unfortunately, the technology is expensive, very hard to use, particularly in low resource settings. So after about 18 months of working with the engineering team, we came up with a mobile pulse oximeter appropriate for use in neonates that's about 15 times less expensive than traditional mobile technology. And there's a little bit about this um, in this video, so I can stop talking about it. What if a little red beam of light could save hundreds of thousands of newborns? Sepsis, pneumonia, and congenital heart defects. Together, these hard to detect conditions are among the top killers, claiming nearly two million newborn lives every year. That's eight babies every minute of every day. Doctors and researchers around the world started looking at how a tiny red beam of light could help flag serious health conditions in those first precious hours of life. The red beam of light was called pulse oximetry. The technology had been around for a quarter century and was so commonly used, doctors called it the fifth vital sign. This is how the BORN project was born. Now, in an unprecedented collaboration between governments, clinicians, industry, and nonprofit, the BORN project has yielded the world's first affordable hospital-grade mobile pulse oximeter for newborns in the most challenging, low-resource settings. Thanks to the Newborn Foundation's advocacy, pulse oximetry screening has become a universal standard in the United States and in a growing number of countries around the world. We now know the little red beam helps detect hidden health problems in the littlest babies. Training and screening protocols have been embedded in a simple mobile app and the baby's results can be easily sent anywhere there's a cellular signal, from frontline health workers to clinicians who can help with diagnosis and follow-up. In short, early detection means early intervention. Babies survive, babies thrive. Okay, um, so our project, uh, as it's expanding in China, is in Sichuan. You'll see that tiny little blue dot in the middle. There, that's about where Chengdu is, which is where our referral center for the babies that end up having severe cardiac anomalies end up going for surgeries. And our main project site is about 100 kilometers north of there in Minyang. They are our data reporting hub and our training and resource hub. So the um, 50 hospitals approximately surrounding Minyang that are county and village level are where we're doing our training and education. We just returned from the second visit to China to, to do that very thing. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea of what we're looking at in terms of the birth population, then just our pilot study, so you can imagine what that looks like when you extrapolate it. But we expect approximately 7,500 newborns just within our, our 52,000 um, birth population that will have one of those three target conditions within a one-year period. So our training materials include um, everything from um, dolls that we can use that we've taken. We've actually done a whole series of uh, photography and um, videos. We have a really nice 10 minute training video that's uh, been used internationally. It's been translated into Mandarin um, and is, is being widely used um, in, in our training sites and beyond actually in China. And then um, we've done posters, um, lanyard cards for the nurses that are doing this on the front lines. And uh, this is the uh, algorithm, the screening algorithm that's been um, being used a slight modification from what we use in the United States. So a double screen instead of a triple screen. And then these are just a, a couple of photos just from about, what, four, six weeks ago in Sichuan province where we did our training at this hospital in particular. We had about 50 hospital staff, nurses and administration there, including some public health officials from Sichuan, or from um, Minyang. And uh, this is in Baishuan, and this is actually that hospital um, is the rebuilt hospital. The, this is the one uh, building in, behind that pile of rubble is, is the one that it replaced. So this area was um, incredibly devastated. Just five years ago, 100,000 people perished right in this area. So there's a, a profound sense of um, responsibility to life and to um, protecting newborn life in particular. So it's been a real honor and privilege to work with the principal investigators and our entire team there. So I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn um, to just quick talk about the data reporting piece of this. And um, I should know Dr. McGregor uh, just received, just very recently, the um, Order of Australia. So I feel like she would, I don't know if I'm supposed to curtsy or something with that, but <laughs> I'm just so proud that she's part of our project and that we've gotten to know each other over these few years. Thank you. And thank you. Oh, well, I thought I only had five seconds, but okay. <laughs> 
So I'll be very brief. Anna Marie, Anna Marie and my paths crossed about two years ago. I have a background in analytics in banking, retail and finance. I met a neonatologist uh, many years ago now in 1999, um, but my path similar to Anna Marie's is very personal as well. I did give birth to a child premature and were I living in any of these developing countries, I would have died because I did develop preeclampsia and eclampsia and she had a very rare chromosome condition. So this is a very personal journey for me because I've lived the journey of losing a child. Um, I've used my analytic skills to develop what's known as the Artemis Project, which is for, um, named after the Greek goddess of childbearing. In essence, we're using every signal, every second, to look at high frequency behaviours, to look for infection earlier and a number of other signals. So this is an example of some of the work we did. Every bar represents an hour. The blue is everything that is going well, yellow to red showing that things are not going so well. What's of relevance here is it's the second bar in from this end when they, when they actually suspected infection at the bedside, whereas we were detecting issues much earlier on. So we've used this same approach um, in not only in um, neonatology, I'm also working on a project now with the Canadian Space Agency and NASA to take this into uh, long range space flight. Uh, we've also taken it into uh, Chinese hospitals um, and using different algorithms now. So this is an example here about uh, work we're doing for neonatal spells when they have pauses in breathing and, and um, bradycardia and other problems as well. Um, so very briefly, evolution of the architecture. We built the initial architecture, which we're showing here 2009, made it available in the cloud, which has relevance now for the project we're now doing with Anna Marie um, and also our Apollo project, which is taking this outside of the hospital um, so that we can then consider how we can use this in low resource settings. If we can just get the signals from that device that Anna Marie was showing you, then we can do some very high level analytics on babies and just provide that information just through that signal coming from a smart device um, with using these particular things. And this is an example of the Companion Apollo project where we've been monitoring graduates of the neonatal unit in their home. Um, in a number of countries as well. So they were the main pieces. So moving forward now, we're looking at synergizing the projects together to support. Um, ironically and interestingly, we both have been collaborating with uh, the Children's Hospital of Fudan University in Shanghai. I've been working with the neonatal unit. She's been working with the healthy newborn unit and we didn't realize that until we started to collaborate together. So we have some great opportunities to bring this, uh, con these concepts to support newborn screening in many countries. Thank you. And if Anna Marie, did you want to come up? Is there any questions? And uh, the title of Francois' uh, presentation to you is How Telemedicine Shortens Distance in Mali. So uh, over to you. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, Mohamed's uh, passport is still somewhere in between Ireland and Mali and has not been recovered yet, so he wasn't able to make it. Um, I work for uh, IICD, the International Institute for Communications and Development, and I'm going to tell you about this uh, teleradiology project that we've been facilitating. It has been executed by um, a local partner in Mali and uh, designed, in fact, and tweaked by this very partner. Um, you may know Mali, or you may not, uh, that it's one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, uh, in fact, um, if you look at the health uh, situation in Mali, you will see that um, there's a huge shortage of experts. And in the field of radiology, uh, for instance, there are 11, or there were 11 ex uh, radiologists, uh, of whom 10 were in the capital, and one Chinese one was in the town of Sikasso at the start of this project. So in all the regional hospitals which we targeted, um, ranging from, let's say, a distance from two, three hundred kilometers to 1,500 kilometers for the furthest um, regional hospital. There was maybe some X-ray equipment would be available, but no expert to do a good diagnostic. So um, uh, this resulted in, a, in, in fact, in a, in a, in a continuous uh, situation of poor diagnosis and a situation whereby patients would be um, uh, almost all referred to the national hospital if the, 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 the technician or the general's doctor would uh, not be able to uh, or feel that he would not be able to really do a do good diagnosis on the, the x-ray. And um, once in the capital then uh, the patient would redo a x-ray because uh, well it's the standard procedure. So this will also enhance costs. 
um, and, and huge costs for the patients. Uh, you can imagine if you have to travel 1,500 kilometers to uh, capital to do, to do a diagnosis, um, what, what cost that, that enhances. Um, so the, the objectives of, of the program at the time were to introduce telemedicine in, in order to improve diagnostics in rural hospitals, in the regional hospitals, I should say, uh, and to improve the quality of the primary diagnosis at the level of these uh, regional hospitals at the general doctors. Um, the third uh, objective was, of course, to look into the sustainability of such an operation. Uh, you should know that um, at the time of the beginning of, of this project in 2005, none of these regional hop hospitals had a local area network or whatever ICT equipment of high um, value inside the hospitals. Uh, neither uh, had any of them uh, an internet connectivity. So um, in the sequence in the, the subsequent uh, years, we gradually connected um, some of these hospitals. Um, 2005, we started with uh, three hospitals, Mopti, Sikasso, Timbuktu, uh, and then we expanded to other hospitals in the uh, following years. Um, the, the, the way it works is that um, uh, a, a generalist doctor would take an X-ray, would digitize this X-ray, and um, uh, would do this uh, in the later stages. We, we started with fairly uh, expensive equipment of digitization uh, of X-rays uh, according to standards, and then we went back to very simple um, uh, methodology of taking a picture of the projected X-ray on the screen, um, and a 5 MB picture would be sufficient in general to, um, to uh, allow the radiologist in Bamako to do a good diagnosis. And this would be sent to a web platform with an interface on both sides so that the journalist as well as the, 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 the radiologist could have a, 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 a platform on which to exchange the, uh, the X-ray and the diagnosis. So um, if you look at, at the number of uh, X-rays that has, have been exchanged over the years, you see that um, there has been a, a, a steep um, a rise uh, 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 along the years, um, uh, up to 1,200 approximately in, uh, in uh, 2009, and then a decrease. The, 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 the steep decrease in 2012 and 2013 can be uh, allocated to the, 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 the rebellion in, in Mali and the war, the civil war, whereby uh, the hospitals of Gao and Timbuktu and Ken Kidal were ransacked and, and had to shut down. But um, the, the, let's say the, 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 the tendency of decrease, uh, and this is, I think, uh, one of the most interesting results of this project, um, uh, uh, can be related to the increased capacity of the generalist doctors to do a good diagnosis in the regional hospital. So um, uh, I'm not sure that you can read all the, we also looked at the, the type of scans that have been exchanged. The red um, bar, uh, in fact, is um, uh, we started, or they started in 2009 to also offer the service to a mining company uh, in Morila, the gold mine com company, which uh, then has increased over the years the, the, the number of um, especially chest x-rays that they have to do on, on a yearly basis. So in, um, in 2014, we conducted a research uh, together with a jigsaw consult, and we looked into um, the data that we had um, um, on, the, on the basis of uh, the, 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 the platform. Uh, so we looked at the date of the, 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 the x-rays, uh, the patient's unique code, uh, the hospital, the priority, whether it was an urgent or non-urgent x-ray, sex of the patient, age, etc. Uh, and we calculated the number of images diagnosed using teleradiology um, versus um, the, the agreement between the generalist doctor and the radiologist. Uh, we had, uh, unfortunately, in 2014, uh, we, had, mm, we couldn't have access anymore to all the data that we would have liked to, so we had to do some exercises there. Um, we also did a qualitative uh, survey amongst uh, the medical personnel who has, had been uh, associated to the project. And um, we, so we, we, we did uh, qualitative interviews with uh, the regional directors, the 
hospital directors, the, the, the doctors in the hospitals, and some technicians in the hospitals. So if you look at the results, um, the, I think the, 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 the major results is that um, the, the diagnostics have been improved indeed via this methodology of telemedicine. Um, and you see that where um, um, uh, the, 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 the number of, um, well, no, I should, I should explain a little bit more. Um, in fact, um, one of the assumptions at the start of the project was that the, the, general, uh, the regional hospitals would only send in the difficult x-rays or the ones that they found complicated. In reality, we saw that, uh, especially the, 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 the most remote hospitals, just sent in all the x-rays, indicating that they had no confidence in their own uh, capacity of uh, uh, diagnosis. So um, uh, at the beginning of the project, you, you, you would see that um, uh, the, the, the hospitals would send in all the x-rays, and, and this then decreased over the years. The other result, um, and this is also, I think, uh, one of the very nice results of this, uh, this uh, project, was that you, you see that uh, over the years, the regional doctors um, um, uh, who had, let's say, a, a, a almost zero uh, percent uh, diagnostic agreement at the beginning of the project reached a 73 percent diagnostic agreement by 2013. And this is a strong indicator in their um, capacity to diagnose, let's say, uh, increased capacity to diagnose the x-rays, but also in their self-confidence, we would say. So other benefits of the service, um, uh, I will not go into them too deeply, um, uh, were um, especially on the, the quality of health care, but also benefits for patients and um, a number of other things. Um, Sustainability of the operations, I think uh, we reached also. The, the, we have not been funding the, uh, the operations anymore since 2009. And were it not, let's say, the, the war, the civil war in Mali, the operations would still go on. The service is almost free. Uh, the only cost associated to the service are, in fact, the, the, the expert advice and um, some investments in the platform, uh, the hosting of the service, etc., etc. So um, um, cost benefits for uh, hospitals. Some qualitative data that, um, that uh, were uh, given to us is that um, um, well, patients stay rather longer at the hospital than go to, uh, to Bamako. Um, the, the additional cost for the regional hospitals is minimal. And there is also a financial benefit for the regional hospital in the sense that they can retain, let's say, the patients in, instead of referring them to Bamako. Um, other findings, um, well, one, one of the interesting one is that we saw that the introduction of the teleradiology in this case also facilitated the ICT uptake, the e-health uptake in general in the hospitals. It was the first introduction for most of them to e-health. Um, on the counter side, you could also say that maybe some of the successes of this project were largely um, uh, um, uh, related to the, 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 the high motivation of uh, the local staff who executed it uh, and their very uh, strong um, uh, investment. So concluding, uh, we found that teleradiology contributed to an improvement of the quality of healthcare in the regional hospitals, um, in the sense that it improved the regional doctor's diagnostic ability and it improved the, also the quality of the prescribed treatment. There is a, 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 a net reduction of the need for patients to travel. And um, in, in general, we could say that uh, according to this low cost model, it is possible to sustain a teleradiology operation um, on a, a model of uh, in-country uh, um, uh, peer diagnosis for very low cost. Just, just one final thing. Um, uh, uh, I was not able in this presentation to give you all the, all the results of the, of the research we did because the, the paper we uh, submitted and which was accepted by the Journal of Telemedicine and Telecare has not yet been published. So uh, sorry for that, but I hope that once it's been published, uh, you can dive into the, the other details. Great. Could I just ask one burning question in my head? Um, when you... When you 
increase diagnostic ability, the, ch the possibility, um, not so much the possibility, the absolute definite increase in uh, requirement for treatment. Uh, have you made any measurement on that and on the impact of better diagnosis, which is a, obviously a good thing, but it does have a knock-on effect for uh, demand on services and treatment? Yeah, well, um, I'm not a doctor myself, yeah. So, yeah. but, but, but um, uh, I, um, what I think um, uh, the, 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 the starting assumption of this project is that um, the, the regional hospitals have a technical plateau that is that uh, that, that can or that could um, that's probably respond to uh, a lot of um, uh, things. Were they able to uh, do a good diagnosis? Um, now, of course, you know if you, if you want to do a, 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 a difficult or complicated surgery, mm -hmm. maybe in the end the the, 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 the the patient will have to be referred to Bamako anyway. Yeah. But um, you can you, you you may avoid let's say the situation whereby a patient has to go to Bamako in okay. all the cases. Gotcha. Very good answer. Very good. Is there any other question, burning question from anybody on the on the floor? No. Oh. Ladies first. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, the, the let's say the radiologist who um, who um, performed let's say the the, the, the peer diagnosis is uh, uh, the highest highest um, expert let's say in his field in in, in, in in Mali. So, of course, if he he would um, um, have the impression that he is not sure of his own diagnosis, he can still also send it to an international platform. Um, uh, and so, uh, I, I mean, um, uh, the, the partner we've been working with is also associated with the uh, RAFT, so the Réseau Africain de Francophone de Téléphonie. So via that platform, you would be able to submit certain, uh, certain X-rays also to a, a wider platform of in international experts, if you would want so. Okay, thank you. I'm going to leave it at that in, in 10 minutes. Is it a quick question? Yes. Sir. Okay, go on. A quick clarification. So let me just understand, um, at the local hospital, the, uh, the scan is done and then it's, it's reviewed locally and sent to Bamako uh, electronically or it's just done once? Well, it, 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 this has changed over the years. This is, I think, what, I, what I've tried to, to, to explain. Um, the generalist doctor can decide him or herself uh, whether he um, or she sends uh, an, uh, a request for a peer diagnosis uh, uh, via the platform to Bamako. So if he or she considers that there's no need for it um, because he or she is able to do a good diagnosis uh, on the spot, she or he will not do that request. Um, uh, but uh, we saw that in the, in the early days of this project, um, in fact, the regional hospitals, doctors or technicians uh, uh, in place would uh, decide to send the whole bunch uh, anyway. So every scan, every x-ray they would send to Bamako because, and this has decreased over the years. Um, uh, and, and they have also, when we checked uh, via the qualitative interviews, they have indicated that it is because they, um, they have gained, let's say, uh, capacity to do a good diagnosis. Okay, I was just wondering whether you thought of ever. Sorry. Okay, no, okay. I just want to. Okay. Thanks. So our last presenter in the session is Anne uh, Genitz. Is that right, Anne? Yes. Yeah, very good. And Anne is from the London Knowledge Lab, and Anne's going to talk to us about a mobile intervention for training community health workers to assess the stages of child development. Um, an interim evaluation of that project. So, Anne, um, thanks. Thank you. This picture was taken on one of our exchange visits. The first team is based in Kibera, an urban informal settlement in Nairobi. And the second team of um, community health workers and their supervisors is based in Makweni, a rural semi-arid region in eastern Kenya. With community health workers and their supervisors, we co-designed a smartphone app 
to assess the developmental milestones of children. We are happy to take questions about why we chose to take a smartphone or to develop a smartphone app rather than low, using low-end phones at the end. If you're going to take anything away from this presentation, I would like it to be these two points. Community health workers uh, learning benefits from using smartphone apps. And as a direct result from that, our interim evaluation suggests that their practice is changing substantially. But first, let's take a step back. The project is based on the assumption that community health workers are not consumers of information, but producers of knowledge. Consequently, our project moves away from information acquisition models of learning to models focused on successful social participation. And by that, I mean, for example, peer learning. Accordingly, the project has been designed as a mobile intervention that supports complex uses by community health workers. So for example, rather than a supervisor making a final referral decision for a child, the community health worker is empowered to do so by using the app. We worked with community health workers and their supervisors in a participatory manner to design and develop the app. The community health workers and their supervisors identified a need for increased training and supervision with regard to child developmental stages, particularly for children under five. In consultation with subject experts, we decided to use the Malawi Development Assessment Tool as a basis for the app. The result of this process and the closed co-design process with community health workers and their supervisors is the so-called referral app. Its focus is on developmental milestones for, for children under five, and the app leverages smartphone technology and allows for the collection of data by the community health workers. It also allows for their assessment report and their referral decision to be directly sent to their supervisor for review and for feedback about their decision. The community health workers then receive feedback from their supervisors about their decision. This is how the app looks like on a smartphone. So on the left, we see the app as community health workers see it, where they can create a record for each child, give their feedback about whether a child needs to be referred or not, and can see the feedback from their supervisors. On the right, we see the app as the supervisor sees it and the referral decisions made over time by the community health workers. The app has been in use for 11 months now and so far we have noted a change in practice, training and supervision quality of community health workers. Monitoring and supervision of community health workers has been improved. There has been an increased awareness at household level on importance of child development monitoring and an increase in informed referral of children with developmental delays. Before, community health workers were often over-referring because they weren't sure whether a child needs to be referred or not. But now they refer because they know they have to refer a child. And as a direct result of that and of using the app, a significant number of disabled, we call them hidden children, have been discovered due to the focus on children under five and the systematic assessment. Most recently, we have developed a toolkit to enable supervisors and public health officers to develop their own mobile web apps without the need for tech skills. And the training for that will begin next week. Thank you, and here is our website for more information, and we are happy, oops, happy to take questions now. So. And thank you very much. I'm going to jump in just because the question we asked earlier, because you've nailed it there, and that uh, you know, you've seen a change in physician behaviour or health worker behaviour, um, and that's improved uh, practice. Uh, could you give me any specifics on what you observed, what, what, what actually improved? So, as I mentioned, especially, for instance, the disabled children, the, the health workers had not been trained to assess children under five or had just 
trained to a very liminal um, amount and or limited amount. And so as a direct result of going to families and assessing the development of under fives, of children under five, they actually uh, discovered, for instance, in the region of Kibera, at least 20 families, and there are probably many, many more, um, children who are severely disabled, um, speaking of cerebral palsy and their other, other disabilities. And these children were not uh, on the radar at all of the health workers before. And actually, as a direct result of that, the community health workers now have started to form support groups for the parents, the families, because disability in Kenya is a huge stigma, mm -hmm. at least in Kibera. So very often the parents would just keep their children indoors. They were hidden. Even the closest neighbors wouldn't know that there was a disabled child living next doors. And obviously that has a massive impact on their health because they never get to see sunlight. Um, and that's one of the major well, that, that's an amazing example, actually, uh, of actually something we probably wouldn't think of automatically measuring is kind of that opening up to groups that with cultural issues and so on. That, that, that's actually really, really interesting for me anyway. Uh, any questions from the floor? We have a minute or two. No? Okay. Um, well, we'll, we'll leave it at that, and thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, well that ends the uh, second scientific session uh, of the conference today. I'd like to uh, thank all our uh, speakers and uh, I found all of the, the presentations incredibly interesting and really some food for thought, especially those of us that are involved in training uh, over here, uh, you know, uh, how we do it and how we're tra we've stuck with our traditions and there's some obviously new ways that we can learn from uh, how we've actually leaped uh, some of the workforce challenges in some of the developing countries. I think it's, it's, it's something we've got to kind of reflect on. Um, so on, on, on behalf of myself and the organisers and I guess all of us here, we'd just like to thank you for your, your presentations. Thanks.